Virginia. All right. Well, it is great to see everyone this afternoon. Thank you to everyone who has stuck with us through this amazing day. Hello. I know it is tough to get through to the final panel, but we have such an amazing group of women leaders here with us, um, and I'm really excited to hear some of their stories. I'm gonna give Hello. everyone a brief introduction, um, and then I will let them kind of kick it off from there. Um, we're gonna be talking, as Polly said, about mentorship, about um, creating those meaningful relationships at work and in your personal life that, that are so vital to, to women and, and really to anyone um, to get us through some of these tougher days. Um, so let's get started. Uh, we have with us today Maura Collins, the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, Sarah Carpenter, a Burlington City Councilor and the former head of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, Leslie McCrory-Wells, the co-owner of three restaurants in Burlington, Pizzeria Verita, Trattoria Delia, and Soto Inoteca, and Chuha Sampson, the owner of A Single Pebble a Restaurant in Burlington, Pat Moulton, the Executive Director of Vermont State College's Workforce Development Office and the former President of Vermont Technical College, and Ellen Collar, the Executive Director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Did I get those all right? Let's just nod. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a question for all of you. I'm wondering if you could each, in your pairs. Um, tell us about a particular moment um, in your careers where your relationship with the other person um, helped get you through, where it was a moment that you felt, you know, I couldn't have done this without the other person sitting next to me right now. Um, and Sarah and Maura, let's start with you. Polly Major will know that I was jumping out of my skin when I had this opportunity to speak because I love this story I'm about to tell. And the story starts when I was 25 years old, uh, newly hired by VHFA. Fast forward three or four years and I am now pregnant with my first child. And I uh, had the privilege and grew up during a time where my mother stayed at home, my mother-in-law stayed at home. That was the mental model I had in my head for what would happen when I gave birth. Yet, um, I'd never been a parent before, and I didn't know if I was gonna like it, and if I was gonna be any good at it, and yet I loved my job, and I was kind of good at that. And I was nervous to give up a great job uh, for this idea of staying home with a kid who, you know, at that point, she hadn't proved herself yet, let's be honest. <laughs> she's now about to be 17 and she's proven herself worthy. But uh, I remember being very nervous. I was still at a fairly low level within the organization. I would like to have thought that I had made a good impression, but I'd only been there a little while. And I went to leadership of the organization and said, I thought I was gonna quit my job. I definitely don't think I can handle being a mother and working full time. Could we find a third way? And could I work just 20 hours a week and keep doing what I've been doing and have the time with uh, my child? Uh, due to the flexibility that Sarah showed and the organization that was allowed. And for the 13 years that my three children were home until the youngest one went to kindergarten, I worked just three days a week. And what makes the story special is not that Sarah was willing to pay me less money and give me less vacation time, uh, as that got prorated for being part-time. The special part was, was it was during those 13 years that my career took off at 20 hours a week. Sarah and the rest of the leadership team continued to give me new opportunities, send me to new meetings, grow my network, take on new projects. I had so much that I was able to learn and do and grow so that by the time that little one went to kindergarten, there were some other retirements happening within our executive management team and that's when Sarah turned to me and said, okay, let's try four days a week because we're ready to take you to the next level. And now she retired at the end of 2018 and in 2019 the board of directors, after a national search, decided that I was the right candidate to lead VHFA. And that would not, I would not have been a credible candidate if I'd been mommy tracked. If I had been said, yeah, 
you can work less and we'll put you over here and we'll develop someone else. Instead, I was nurtured and developed and grew in that position, despite the fact that no one saw my commitment to the organization as less than just because I also had a commitment to my family. Thank you, Maura. Maura makes it easy. Um, but it, it wasn't always that easy. I, went, I had been in other organizations where I'd um, frankly worked with more women and it was easier. I went into VHFA as their executive director after seceding someone who had been there for many, many years. It was quite male dominated, as is the finance industry, generally speaking. And we needed a big culture change in that agency and I could see that right out the gate. Um, so I made a few other moves, and including approving Maura um, for her position, which was a new position that we created, um, and she had talent. Um, so it seemed incredibly natural, but she was not on the leadership team level at that point in time, which was uh, probably the hardest part, is you have um, senior leaders, deputy directors, um, program operators, at a higher level, but I said, I need a go-to person, somebody I can confide in, and um, those men were wonderfully talented people and served the agency well, but it was hard for me to bounce my opinion off of them, particularly when it was around some of the workforce issues which they were not as supportive of, including working part-time or giving flexibility. That was a tradition not in our agency, to, you know, almost 20 plus years ago. Um, and so the hard part wasn't working with Maura and introducing her to new ideas. It was working with my colleagues um, and saying, you know, this really can work for the agency. It's good for the agency. We need fresh ideas. You know, I'm more than 25 years older than Maura. We, as were some of those leaders, we we need to be paying attention. And so. Um, I think that's, that's the work and that's my message is, you know, you look at your talent, um, make sure you give folks, any, any employee um, talent, but particularly women who are nurturing, they are running the families, we, we have to accommodate that and we can make it work. It, in a way, it wasn't that hard for Moore and I, it was harder for some of our coworkers who couldn't quite wrap their head around it. Well, why is she not there 40 hours a week? Well, she's there when I want her to be there. Um, and that's what counts, right? Um, so I just, you know, I encourage us. And I, I will say I had support, maybe not so much from some of my male colleagues, but from certain members on my board. So those of you who work for boards, make sure you have strong board members who also understand that um, you can have a professional part-time job and as Moira points out, it served the agency very well in terms of our growing. And, and I always say it, it also made it possible so that I could retire and feel like the agency's in a great plot. Well, I, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you both. Our, our next pair, you don't work directly together at the same organization. You both run your own restaurants. Um, how did you two meet? And, and what is a moment that really sticks out to you where your relationship mattered most? See this on? Okay. Um, no, thank you. We um, don't work at the same restaurant, but we work in an, an industry that I will also say is very male dominated and, um, and also extremely rewarding in many ways. Um, and we met, I, I, I want to say, well, before 2019, but we are on the Flynn board together um, as well as what is now called the Vermont Independent Restaurant Group. Um, which came out of COVID. And what ha essentially what happened um, was that uh, an email went out, um, starting I think with Courtney Bush and at, um, Butch and Babes, went out at the very, very beginning of COVID when we had just gotten shut, we just found out that we were shut down. And it was just a confusing time, obviously, for everybody. But uh, restaurants didn't know what was, we were coming up to the date of being shut down and we were trying to figure out should we be shut down earlier because you know lots of things were happening people were coming in they were sick we were getting calls that somebody had been in our restaurant and you know we didn't know what to do so 
Finally, we were all shut down, and Courtney Bush started a, uh, an email that just was a thread that just went through all the restaurants. And one thing to understand about restaurant um, owners, we go into different restaurants, and we're celebrities. So we all know each other. Um, the servers will come over and say, you know, Chuho from Single Pebbles here, and we'll send them something, you know, send her something, or go over and say hello, or have a glass of wine with her, or whatever. There's a, there's a camaraderie that goes um, with the restaurants. There's 1,400 restaurants in Vermont, um, and many are in that, and of course, in Chittenden County. And so we, um, we all kind of know who each other um, is. So we, uh, this thread started, and each one of us would keep adding people that maybe someone else didn't know until it became this huge thread that was just basically sharing what was going on with our restaurants. Now, we had already had sort of a women's rest owners uh, group that we had been getting together and having dinner together and, um, and getting together. So this kind of just continued that, that piece, of course, in COVID times um, on, in a digital format. Um, and then, uh, I guess, Vermont Independent Restaurants be, kind of came out of that, Juho being one of the first on the Vermont Leadership Council and helping to build it. Uh, the, the Vermont Independent Restaurant Leadership Council helping to build it, as well as Sue Betty, who helped put that together. I got on the, the council a little bit later, um, but that has also been uh, a point where we are able to talk about and spend time talking about some of the issues that are very pertinent and very specific to women owning business that, again, are predominantly um, men, um, uh, do men male-dominated, but also have a lot of, of issues sometimes with um, being a supervisor of men, uh, seeing a woman as maybe not, not seeing me as specifically as, as the boss and some of the issues that go along with that. We've been able to talk through some of those issues. Um, so she's been a tremendous support for me and for many other women who are in this restaurant group and, um, and I'm very thankful. It's helped get us through for sure. I think Leslie just uh, tells most of the story, but I think for me, uh, really, how we form relationship doesn't really, it's, yeah, through a lot of different stuff, but really for me is, my personality, I'm very introvert. And as, you know, as we own our own business, especially restaurant, you juggle a lot of stuff, and you oftentimes think that I am doing this alone. And especially when, the, um, the, I remember the pandemic, first we got shut down. I, you know, we, we all go through, like tell our employee that you don't need to come tomorrow. We only have from 40 people to eight people. I remember that I shared with Leslie is that I, after I tell my dishwasher, he is from, uh, from Bhutan. I said, I don't have a job for you anymore. And he ha was with us for seven years. And I closed my office door and I started crying. And this is the first time I feel like, holy cow, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then, but through all those meetings at Vermont, like our digital or phone conversation, realized everyone, everyone is working uh, for each other, support each other. Even simple and silly things, I don't have a, who knows where can I order takeout, order, uh, takeout containers. There's, Something like that, it's very, very little. And as our relationship form, I think more so is it really encouraging to think that, yeah, it's competitive restaurant. You suppose, suppose she's my competitor, but I really never thought that way. And by how we grow is support each other, support the big environment and move us along. And, and I think that's really our uh, goal as Vermont Independent uh, Restaurant Coalition. And, Really, it's really nice to have a folks that you can talk to. Uh, some, in summer of July, I got personally <laughs> in, into a PR crisis, and I was like, okay, what should I do? I didn't tell anyone, but then the next morning, she called. And that really supported me to like, oh, okay, I'm not alone, I'm gonna be okay. I will go through it, and I did, so.
Thank you both. And now to our final pair. Tell us about how you, you two first met. Well, we first met in the way, way, way back, like 30 years, I think it was. Um, but my story is when the uh, prior chancellor of the state colleges called me up one day and said, we're closing the Vermont Tech Randolph campus, we're moving everything to Castleton, and uh, get ready. Um, which was not a hint of said call, prior to said call. Um, after I peeled myself off the ceiling and had some choice words for said chancellor. Um, fast forward a few days, the plan that he had to close Northern Vermont University, close the Randolph campus, thankfully was taken off the table by the Board of Trustees, the Governor, the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Tem, a protest in Montpelier, you name it. Um, but about Four or five days after that, I think, I got this call from Ellen Kaler. Now, I'd known Ka Ellen for 30 years from her start with the um, Social Justice, uh, Pieces Ju Justice Center, but I really knew her as the mother of Vermont Farm to Plate. I mean, this lady right here is why we get to eat really good food in really great restaurants because she really kicked it off. And I knew she had experience in building community. I knew she knew how to bring a network together. I knew she knew agriculture. And she said, what are we gonna do about your ag program, Pat? If you close the can campus, you have no farm. You have no ag program. You lose your 540 acres of asset. What do you think if I pulled together a group of subject matter experts to really talk about how we could reinvent your ag program and really get it back on the map? And knowing Ellen, it didn't take me a second to say yes, yes, yes. That's what I need. And she turned on her network and with a couple of other amazing ladies, Regina Beidler and Louise Calderwood, and we met every week at 7.30 a.m. via Zoom um, for two years and counting. I mean, I think we're every other year now, but brought together this amazing team and we've come up with this amazing plan to reinvent our ag program. And I mean, even like the 7.30 meetings were like, how y'all doing? You know, cause we would take time, the three of us and rah, 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 you know, coming out of my mouth and rant and rave. And these ladies listened and we heard everybody's story, th things that were going on. And that was the other piece of it is like, Women care how each other are doing and you give each other a chance to vent and practice and, and be part of a team. So fast forward to today, we've already raised over, well, through grants, over a million seven to really launch the new ag program. We're gonna kick it off fall 23. We're working on another $750,000, but, and we have to thank, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, um, and we have to thank, Senator Leahy and other, and Senator Sanders and others for assisting us, but I thank this lady right here and her amazing ability to build community, build consensus, build buy-in. Um, you know, had our chancellor talked to more than just a couple other people, we might have had a better plan when, than what he came up with, but I can't say enough about this lady right here, and she has bailed my butt out many a time. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't have made that call if uh, I didn't have the same level of mutual respect for Pat. Um, she has been an incredible leader for decades in the state, uh, in, the, in the realm of economic development and workforce development. She's made a lot of stuff happen, and especially for women. And being, uh, coming out of economic development and being, then becoming the president of a higher ed institution was no easy matter. Um, but then to be faced with um, losing the one hands-on food and ag program in the state, like I just, I personally couldn't handle it because um, we had been putting all of these other plans. We, the, the, a lot of we people have been putting a lot of plans in place to eat, grow our local food system even more. And we're thinking about how do we grow our New England food system and achieve a 30% regional food consumption by 2030. So to like hear that the chancellor was gonna shut down this program, it was like, uh, no, that is not gonna happen. We're gonna get together with Pat, we're gonna make something else happen, and we're gonna put this program on the map, even though it had been in decline for, for many, many years. It needed, it needed a reboot. And so I give Pat a lot of credit, actually, for saying yes, because that's the other part of leadership 
right? It's not just being a leader. In the case of Pat, she's an amazing leader. She's been at the top of many organizations in the state for a long time. But it takes leadership to understand how you need other people and how you create the space for other people to exercise their leadership, right? I had something in a moment of crisis for Pat to offer Pat, but Pat also offered the opportunity for, for me because we, the, the food system development work we were doing was not going to be able to move forward if Pat's program went down the toilet, right? So we needed each other in, in different ways for different reasons, but ultimately for the same outcome. And so Pat saying yes at a point of vulnerability, really, quite frankly, was huge. And that's another part of, I think, one of the strengths of women in leadership is our ability to just like, yeah, we can still be vulnerable, but we can still be really strong and we can be there for each other, in t especially in times of crisis. And had we not had a, a long-term relationship, it probably wouldn't have gone like, not yeah, not as smoothly. And you might have even said, I don't know, like, because there's a the trust there, right? That's, that's the thing about really good relationships is that you build trust. And it's through that trust, especially in times of crisis, where um, we can step forward for each other and we need to step forward for each other. Um, and, I, and so for those of you who are like in the Gen X generation that I'm in or the baby boom generation, if you haven't yet found what Sarah did with Mora to help mentor and bring the next generation along, please, please think about how to do that. Because we need the next generation to, to be in these positions of leadership and to make space for that. And we, we mobilized an awful lot of folks uh, here at Vermont Tech to get the new program, but it's for that next generation, right? It's that next generation of farmers and food entrepreneurs that we're ultimately setting the table for. So thinking about what are, what are the institutions and the organizations that are gonna enable that, and how do we, who have some ability to uh, mobilize money, mobilize other people. How can we be in service to really engage and, and, and make that happen? So um, just amazing group of women up here and uh, let's hear some questions that you might have. <laughs> How about that? All right, let's do it. <laughs> Well, I want to be mindful of time, of your time. Um, so I'm going to let you know now that we have a couple minutes at the end of this conversation for questions from the audience. So, so start thinking about those. Um, and while you do, um, I have one more question uh, for this group. Uh, Chuho, when you brought up that story of, of you know, having a moment of, of crisis at work uh, and feeling really alone and then getting a call the next day from Leslie, um, it, it made me tear up a bit. I, I've had those moments too where I was feeling so alone um, and somebody reached out or picked up the phone um, or sent me something in the mail. And I think those moments of connection, especially since the pandemic, are so hard to find when you can't just invite someone out for coffee anymore all the time. You might be stuck on Slack or, you know, you might be just physically or mentally isolated. I'm wondering if any of you have other examples like that phone call of a moment where you either feel like, like you reached out effectively um, and made a good connection or where somebody did that for you. Because um, I think we could all use a couple ideas of how to, to strengthen those bonds in this time. Um, so I won't call on anyone in particular, but uh, if each of you has something that pops into your mind, go ahead. Maura. I'm always wanting to grab the mic. Um, so what my brain goes to is that um, I have reached out to uh, younger women and tried to um, engage them. Sometimes I'm gonna admit that that feels mighty presumptuous. Uh, I'm 45 years old and I don't know where I fit in generationally in leadership right now. Like am I, a, I don't think I'm a young leader anymore. I know that there are still many shoulders I'm standing on top of, so I'm, I'm caught in between. And so, you know, you don't like call someone up and say, hey, do you want a mentor? Because I think I got a lot to offer you. You know, that, I just want to own that there's an uncomfortability with this developed naturally, okay? This was not, you know, me turning to Sarah and be like, will you be my mentor? Because I also want to acknowledge 
I actually have like eight other mentors, I would say, if, you know, there's just, I love the team approach because Sarah was such a subject matter expert for me that in the housing finance um, arena, she was the, the best one to go to, but there were other professional settings where I had other people in my life that really helped build me up. So instead, what I've learned to do is I always try to find ways to appreciate other women. And so going back to like calling the woman up who you know who's having a hard time and just making that connection. Or Ellen just had a wonderful profile in Vermont Business Magazine two months ago where um, we got to read about all of her professional accomplishments. You know, making sure to shout that out in public settings and call attention to it. Elevating other women, boosting them up. I have not had big experiences of other women tearing me down or vice versa. That hasn't been my experience, but I, I have read about it. I know it happens. And so I think that I don't offer myself as a mentor or something. I more just try to continually lift up other women, amplify their voices in meetings, but also reach out privately through text or something to encourage them or um, uh, really appreciate them. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I just um, want to acknowledge what Maura said. And, I, you know, one of the things I'm probably more old school, but I, certainly in organizations I said I like to manage by walking around. And so just talking to people in your office, you know, you can find out a lot, um, just little tidbits. And, and I worry a little bit, um, particularly with Zoom, that doesn't offer itself as much as it used to. So I think we don't have to reinvent it. Make the proactive phone call. Make a proactive text. Um, you know, and it can be a, about not necessarily work, but you know, I heard your daughter got a driver's license today. How's it going? You know, um, those kind of things. Because I, I think we we're gonna have to make ourselves. Um, have those, because that's how you build a relationship. Well, yes. And, well, I, haven't, I got like 85 probably examples, but um, I think the one that is, was the most challenging for me, some of you may have read about this fraud up in the kingdom, uh, EB5. Um, yeah. Never heard of it. That was, have, you haven't heard a thing about that, have you, Michaela? Um, well, when I arrived as Secretary of the Agency of Commerce, and day two, my general counsel and director of EB5 came and said, uh, Houston, I think we have a problem, um, and started showing me some of the red flags. That, at that point, we had no clue how big this was. And I was in over my head. I didn't know where this was going. And I had the fortune of calling Liz Miller, who was Governor Shumlin's chief of staff, and an incredibly bright woman, and Susan Donegan, who was the Commissioner of Finance, Department of Financial Regulation, another incredibly bright woman, woman, and saying, something's going on, I don't know what it is, I don't have all the information, but we can't ignore this. And through Liz's tutel tutelage, and working with Susan to say, look, you, there's got to be something you can do. Um, the three of us really mapped out the plan and calmed me down. And I would say that's been the most challenging professional experience because my integrity was attacked over, and it continues today as I'm still being sued by another lawyer. Um, so, but to be able to have people who were in this mess with me together, women who, and when Liz, Miller, Susan Donegan, and I got subpoenaed to testify at Bill Stanger's sentencing hearing, which I couldn't have dreaded more in my life. And Susan was the first witness, knocked it out of the park. The judge says, we're not retrying this. This is sentencing. Send the rest of your witnesses home. Susan, you know, did a few fantastic job. Like, I literally, like, hugged her and said, thank you so much. But it just... And, and having each other to be able to say, this really bites having to be here. And you, know, and you can't talk about what you're going to say. But that was huge. And I don't think that would have happened for me had they not been women. And so for that, I'm eternally grateful. I have a, I have a quick story. Um, I, was work, I was in Connecticut. I was, it's actually a convoluted story. But I'll just tell you, my daughter was in Connecticut. Um, 
with me, and I was in Connecticut, um, and her, my ex-husband was at Yale, so I, we were trying to keep her in a more predominantly, a more multicultural school experience. Took her out of school in Vermont and brought her down to Connecticut. So I was going back and forth to Vermont um, to finish my master's degree as well as I had a restaurant at the time. And um, I was working at Naugatuck Valley Community College uh, in adult education, helping to build um, online um, education for the, the, the teachers. And um, I got a call, I was working my master's and it just was taking a long time, and I got a call that my dad was very ill. So um, it was really important to me that he was on the stage to give me my master's degree. That was just the most important thing for me to, um, to accomplish. So I talked to my friend and supervisor at the time and said, I just have to go home. And she said, no, stay here, continue to work on your master's degree, and I'll give you all the time that you need to do the writing. So just get your work done. So I'd get my work done, and I'd be able to sit at my desk and work on my writing. And with her help, and with the help of some wonderful professors at the University of Vermont, I finished it. I um, finished my thesis, I, I um, finished my uh, work, and I got my master's degree, and he was on the stage to give it to me. Um, and I, I think the story really here is um, what she said to me, when you're in a position to pay it forward, pay it forward to another woman. Any questions from our audience? And we will pass around a mic. I'm also full of questions, so no pressure. I can keep going. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I will ask one more question. Shout out my name if you think of something. Um, my my final question for you all. Um, you know, more. I think you brought up a great point about um, not uh, the uncomfortability of of um, imposing yourself on somebody and assuming that you have um, knowledge to be shared. Um, at the same time, I know so many of us feel an insecurity um, at work and feel a need for someone to to reach out um, and to make that connection. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you could. Um, each think on on feeling that yourself of that that moment when you were feeling insecure at work, um, perhaps as a younger person or earlier on in your career, um, and that moment when somebody did reach out. Um, was it hard to accept that help? Was it um, was it deeply needed and wanted? Um, I, I think of times when I was a young, uh, like a young journalist, and an older journalist reached out and offered me advice, and I got really snooty about it, and I rejected it, and I said they don't know what they're talking about. Like I write the way I want to write, um, and it took a while to be able to to open up in that way. Um, and I'm wondering if if that resonates for any of you, Ellen. Yeah, I had um, been uh, at the Peace and Justice Center uh, from 1990, and it was now fast forward to 2001. And um, Jan Eastman, who was then at the Snelling Center for Government, and Lisa Lorimer, who then was the president of Vermont Bread Company, was the largest woman-owned business in the state, uh, had gotten, they had become good friends. And they decided that there was a need for a group of people who had gone through the Vermont Leadership Institute to um, think about a career transition at some point, and that everybody was sort of thinking, within the next three to five years, I might want to make a move. And so they had started putting feelers out to, to assemble a little group. We called ourselves the chess club because we were playing chess with each other's lives, basically. <laughs> Not to, we never actually had a board in front of us. Anyways, at the first meeting of our new chess club, there was about seven of us. I, for some reason, got invited to that. I still don't know. But they had their eyes on me. And, um, they, and I was put on the, the proverbial hot seat as the first person. We hadn't even invented our process yet of how we were going to help each other with thinking through a career transition. And um, I'll never forget this. Um, uh, Lisa and Jan said, we think it's time for you to leave the Peace and Justice Center. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, but I, like, I'm here because like three to five years, you know? And they're like, no, now. <laughs> and I was like, what? what? Well, what am I going to do? 
I don't, I don't know what I want to do next. That's why I'm here. They're like, oh, you're going to go to the Kennedy School of Government at, down at Harvard, down in, in Boston. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, and, I, and I literally, I was like, that's how I was. I was like in my chair, like quaking, like, what is going on? People have these ideas about what I'm supposed to do next, and nobody's telling me these things. And like, what? And I, I just remember being so incredibly uncomfortable in my skin and squirming around and just like, uh. But I went to bed that night, and I got up the next morning because we had an overnight. We did an overnight, and just something just settled in me. You know, like they're right, that's right. And so I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. And so it was, but I had to trust these other people that they had my best interests at heart, that they had an idea of what, kind of like Sarah with Mora, like had an idea of what it was that I could, I could help with in the future, like the kinds of things that I could grow into and be a leader for. And, you know, without that moment, I, who knows, I might still be at the Peace and Justice Center in Burlington. Um, but anyways, it was incredibly, I was just feel so fortunate and so grateful that some other women saw something in me that they were willing to step out and make me really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but then, you know, it is, sometimes those things happen. You just have to sit with it and really listen to that voice inside of you. And then you'll know, you'll just know. Perfect. So my story is not a woman reaching out to me, but a man, um, Jeb Spaulding, the aforementioned former chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges, who called me up one day. Now, Jeb and I had worked in state government. He was secretary of administration, but I frankly didn't know that he even knew I existed. And he called me up and said, hey, think about being interim president at Vermont Tech, and, and then you should apply for the job as president at Vermont Tech. I'm like, what? Running a college? What are you, nuts? And uh, I don't know nothing about running a college. In fact, my one of my best friends who passed away, her mother at a baby shower, was, what do you know about running a college? What the hell can you do with that? But, but and you know, so I'm like, sure, I'll, yeah, well, you know, I was transitioning out of the Shumlin administration. I didn't know what I was gonna do next, and, and here I am come down as interim, you know, first woman in a typically all-male technical college, um, and then had to go through this incredible higher ed hiring process of year-long interviews, give a symposium, give this, do that, but Jeb the whole time, Pat, just be yourself, just be yourself, just, just who you are, because I'm like, oh, I gotta act all academic and, you know, get all high and mighty and ivory tower and no, no, just be yourself. And that was the best advice I got. And, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. I loved, loved, loved my five and a half years as president of Vermont Tech. I love what I'm doing now, but I don't think I would have gotten out of the economic development field without that push. So I'm eternally grateful for Jeb for that. Didn't like the phone call about closing the campus, but I will always be thankful to him for making that happen for me. Just listen to uh, both their story. Kind of remind me how I get into a single pebble. Um, so my really biggest mentor or teacher is uh, for a single pebble is um, there's a silent partner actually. Currently he's in Australia back then. So when I apply a single pebble, I was just 2003. I just came to finish my culinary school. And I was looking for internship. And I remember the founder, Steve Bogart, interviewed me by the alley. And I'm like, ah, uh, just so you know, yes, I'm Chinese. I know to eat, how to eat Chinese food. I absolutely don't know how to cook. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know. I didn't know then. Um, but he really taught me. First of all, he's the first one. He taught me how to cook my own cuisine in English. So every day I walk in, there's a new cookbook for me to read. And uh, he would try something new stuff, and I would be like, yeah, 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 this is great, this is great. Oh, I think a little adjustment, but then he will throw me a different project to grow. And the second mentor is that silent partner uh, currently in Australia is, so I only worked there for two, one year, one year and a half. For some reason, become kind of, I was the line cook, and then I, there's something happened in front of the house. So I kind of step in. And English is, as you know, English is not my first language. So 
I love to cook because I don't need to talk to people, right? <laughs> I oftentimes think is I want to cut a chicken into a triangle. Chicken would come say, I don't want to be a triangle. <laughs> but people will something say to you. So got into front house forced me to learn a lot. But then eventually I became partner, became I need to understand the financial part. Uh, accounting, question mark, question mark. This, uh, this partner in Australia, uh, Ed, his name, he starts sending me like the basic accounting textbook and talk to me, walk me through with the QuickBook. So I, right now I do my own payroll, I do my own accounting, I, I do pretty much everything. So I feel like t I become who I am today really would not have done without those two persons in my life. Yeah. Um, I was going to just come and, uh, you know, in addition to my colleagues, there's uh, a number of other women in the housing industry who've become fast friends, and um, we support each other, and we do it with humor. I'm so sorry to have missed that workshop. And sometimes we do it rather rudely, and we challenge each other. We are affectionately known to each other as the Women's Housing Mafia. And I'm sure you would, if I told you who's in the, I can't tell you who's in the Women's Housing Mafia, but if I did, you'd all know them. I'll get it out of you, sir. And um, uh, in case you don't know, public instrumentalities like BHFA have the power through public eminent domain to take property. Not that it ever happened. So we had the Women's Housing Mafia, and we were going to seize and sell property, particularly of people that didn't agree with us. <laughs> now, we never exercised that, but that level of humor and challenge and, you know, like, we're going to seize and sell that property and, you know, we're going to get our mafia lady friends out to get you. <laughs> um, no just, one crossed Sarah Carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> but that level of humor, and it really helped us build a lot of collegiality and um, challenge each other and gave us confidence. I do think that is all of the time that we have today. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Do one more of our many rounds of applause. One more. <laughs> thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you to all, you all for listening. And I think I, I think we're the last panel, so you might be free to go, or or someone from um, Senator Leahy's office is going to pop up. Paul is coming. Okay. <laughs> If you could just stay seated, then I'm not alone up here on the stage. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. This is now the close of the 25th Women's Economic Opportunity Conference and the last that Senator Leahy will sponsor as senator. So it's a really meaningful conference for us, for him, and we appreciate you all for joining us here. We've had such an incredible day. Thank you to our afternoon presenters, the safety team, to this fantastic panel for joining us. I think if we have one theme for the afternoon, it's the power of confidence. And they've certainly uh, taught us skills to practice that in our everyday lives. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, close the conference by acknowledging my co-chairs who helped to make it possible, Heather Gagne and Lisa Briganti back there. and acknowledging you all as participants and fabulous women leaders in the state of Vermont. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.